The Lord thy God will say each and every one of us, I got the plan. Listen to me. Yes, the enemy does not want you to do what I want you to do because he's destroyed you. But now I want to show you what I can do in your life so I can raise you up and send you out and show the world what I can do with a bunch of misfits. Listen to me. Give the Lord a good praise offering. Sometimes you feel like you're not even saved. You're the biggest mess that ever lived. Come on. Yeah. How many can say amen to that? Yeah. But that's when God says, you know, listen, when you think you're like that, that's when God says, that's where I want you because otherwise you're going to be doing something thinking it's you doing it, not me. So when you feel like you're, you're not there, don't worry about it. It has nothing to do with you. It's all God. Amen. We think, you know, we're not... We're not right. That means we're going to try to work harder to be what we think we're supposed to be. And God says, get out of the way. Let me do it. He says, yes, I want you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says, but I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead you. It's not by your might, your power. You understand what I'm saying? Because we go up and down like a yo-yo. Come on. And some of those yo-yos, the new type, new type yo-yos, they start sleeping. They start spinning at the bottom. How many don't talk about it? It's so gracious. Isn't that just being what God wants us to be? Amen. By the way, we had a lot of fun last night. We went to the fair. And when you leave, when we stood outside the fair, that guy preaching across the street, had our signs, you know, and carrying crosses. And then we, right outside the gate, we start singing. And man, I'll tell you what, it took a little while, everybody got around. But once the Spirit of God really hit, it was something. We got some, some women here that are characters. That's the Gallup girls. Gallup girls, stand up. Man, I'm telling you what, they're getting a little wild. They're getting a little frisky. It's fun. Yeah, it's just fun to watch them. Is that true? You guys doing okay? Man, I just... It's good. Through all the battles and struggles you've been through, through all, you know, we're all been through. You know, it's neat how God can raise, you may be seated, He can raise us up. How many believe that? Amen. And use us, and we can even have fun doing it. How many believe that? Amen. That's up to me. If you ain't having fun doing this, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> no, no. If you ain't having fun doing it, you're doing it. Because when you let God do it, man, it is fun. It's exciting. I'm not saying we don't have the battles. We do. But you know what? He's, he's going to raise us above those battles. Amen? 
Because right. I'm dumb enough to believe. I don't care how bad you think things are in your life. The God that I know is bigger and, and better than all the bad stuff. He's better than the bad. Amen? Amen. You understand what I'm saying? He's just going to raise us up and <laughs> minister to us, encourage us, and shake us loose from us. Amen? Because that means He's stronger. See, that is what's so neat. Just God's God, isn't He? Exciting. Doing all the above and, and here in our lives and sit back and watch. Amen. Barbara, come here. Barbara! Met you down there last night. I think, I think she was in a fighting mood. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Because if she, I remember this one lady came by in a wheelchair. She jumped all over. <laughs> and then, wait, the next thing I know, she's got everybody around her praying for her. This see, we're standing outside the fair. And everybody, you know, right at the gate. And everybody, in fact, even the policeman said, this, you every year we go down there, and I said, now just keep it open, and you're okay. So we did. We just stayed back far enough so we wouldn't be, you know, interfering with people going in and out. But she jumped all over this lady. <coughs> what did she do? Uh, now I know what you mean about fighting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this lady came by in a wheelchair, and it's like the Spirit of God, it wasn't me at all, jumped out and asked, said, you need prayers. Well, she did. Her daughter uh, was dying of some kind of a lung cancer or something like that, and she just said, she, my daughter's dying. And, we, and so I got all the girls and whoever wanted to, and we prayed for this lady. Did you get the gallop girls? Yeah, but we had some more victories. There was another lady from, uh, she was an early American, or what do you call them? Uh, anyway, she had her own and I, I could smell it on her. <laughs> she was an Indian. First, I didn't realize that she had been drinking, but I could tell. But anyway, she had lost her husband and was sitting there for two hours with him outside the gate. She didn't know where he was, and he lived on the Indian reservation. And, and I guess he drove in the car too. And I said, "Well, I'll just go home. You know, he'll come home later." She said, "Well, he can't drive. Uh, apparently, he was drinking too much." So she waited and waited, and we prayed. And it wasn't long. There the guy was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, amen. But she did, uh, her, her brother had passed away, and I don't know, just recently. And she was sobbing and grieving over that, and um, she said she did accept Christ recently. So, yeah, she said, uh, a lot of victories out there. That's funny. You know, she's actually older than I am, and she gets up and does all this stuff. Anyway, how about Friday night? Oh, man. Friday night. What did you do Friday night? You mean the girls ain't got no clothes on? No, they don't. Yeah. When we leave there, I'm really glad to get away from you. You know, it's so nice, you guys, now that you can wake up in the morning with a sound mind, sober, not hungry. Thank God you're not like that anymore. You know, it's wonderful. To know the grace of God and what He's done for all of us. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to go there, but I'm glad to leave too. <laughs> you know, I'm the biggest kick out of her. You know, we do a lot of outreach. So she, she's right in the middle of all of them, a lot of them. Truly. But it's so neat to watch her. She'd be just. In fact, was it uh, Scottsdale the other night? What she's talking about, and that's all the up and outers go. The Bentley, the Maserati, you know, and the fancy clubs and all this. And man, that girl ain't got nothing on. 
But anyway, she likes taxi cabs for some reason or another. And every time a taxi cab stops, she's busting. <laughs> she's got the sign to give her a track. Well, they're the only ones out there that are sober. <laughs> What he's able to do in our lives, I'm going to tell you something, when they can see it in us, that's probably going to be the, the greatest way to minister. i got to put in there, i got to share this. The greatest way to, to minister. You know, this day and age, this is crazy. You go up and talk to people about God, they're, what God are you talking about? It's not about Jesus anymore being God. Our society is so screwed up and so humanized or whatever. It's like college, you five, whatever. You know, it's they're taking God out of everything, except for our election. Wait, get guess who just got? Yeah. 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 Who just got put in office by two votes? I believe that man loves God with all his heart, and I believe he's going to be one of those who's going to be able to change. In other words, yeah. I didn't mean, say that. No, yeah, I did. I'll, I'll tell you something, it's so neat. I was so excited to realize we got him in there. He's going to make a stand for the Bible. How many believe that? I mean, listen, we got to make a stand. You know, some of us... Oh, that's what, you got to I'm going to say this. Some of us just go along, we get kicked around, bounced around. You know, just, okay, okay, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Pooh! we got to go do our part. You know, we got to go fight this good fight of faith. You know what the Bible says? You go take the land. Don't be, don't be down there and listen to them. Well, there's giants here. There's, there's intellectuals. There's people that know more than we do. No, let's go take the land. Amen? Amen. Let's make our stand. God's going to, we win. God wins. I don't care what all the people say. I might as well use that word again. I'm not. I don't care what they all say. God's going to build his church and the gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. And I don't care what all the churches are doing today. Getting wishy washy. God's going to build his church. How about you do that? Try so this We get fired up. And just let him have his way. Right. Amen. Terry, for you. We got a little video. And then we'll let Terry explain it. Yes. All right, Terry. We had an amazing, amazing dinner. Friday night, we had 70 volunteers from Rock Point Church. Um, all three campuses come out and feed us. Table style, you know, restaurant style, chicken and pasta. They brought the word of God. They, um, great entertainment, great worship team. And then they passed out, you know, raffles and hygiene items and then left items with us. And so men got some hygiene items, women got some hygiene items. We had um, blankets come in, shampoo and conditioner. Brent, I stole you a crate, wherever Brent, wherever, uh, Brent is. And so we're going to go ahead and show the video. Sound like everybody had a pretty good time. Yeah. It's gracious, it's beautiful. The presence of God, amen. You ready to get the crosses in? You know, we got some needs. How many have needs? We all have needs over. Let's just pray for some different needs. Then come up here and pray for. By the way, we got a couple got to go to jail tomorrow. We got a guy that just had an operation um, not too long ago, and he's he needs healed. So, you know, even though there's many, many uh, unspoken requests, so whatever it is, God knows, and let's just pray for the needs, our needs, other people's needs. Let's pray more so for people to get saved. Let's pray for our government. Let's pray the power of God. If I can see little by little, God's, he's edging in. I don't care what she says. This, this country's crazy. It's falling apart. Sin, the ways of sin is death. We're getting drunk down. But I'm going to tell you something. Let's be the remnant. Let's just... Believe, Amen. trust God, and pray. We need to pray, don't we? That's another thing we do. We just need to get down on our face and start praying for the power of God. Amen. Amen. Pray for the need. Father, we just come before you and we just thank you, Lord, for the day. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us, first of all, a spirit of thanksgiving. Lord, as Job said, though you slay us, we will trust in you. 
Father, I pray that we really have a new gratitude, Father God, and realize that you bless us, Father God. And if we receive the good things, we can also receive the bad things because nothing comes to us that is in first pass to you. So, Lord, I pray that those that are struggling, they would hold on, Father God, to your unchanging hand, Father God. Encourage him, Lord. I pray that we'd find rest in you, Lord. I pray that anyone needing healing, you would heal them. Deliverance. Deliver them, Father God. Set free, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we see just your operation in our government and the powers that be, Lord, that you lift up and you raise down, Father. And we just trust in you, Lord, that we will continue to pray and see your hand all over the United States and here in church in the street. We thank you, Father, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bring in the drop. Pastor Walsh program. It has nothing to do with the rain. Rain, skin, and snow, you're out there. I didn't know this before I was feeling, but I still was out there praying. So the word of God is within us at all times. Amen. Um, well, while we got there, there was a guy, he was uh, talking to himself, and um, he was down and out. So right when I got out, I, uh, Kevin, the driver, was like, why don't you give him something like a a water or give a good word or something. So I walked up to him and I gave him water and, and something um, sweet and he kept saying that, this is something sweet, this is something sweet. And I was like, it's from the Lord. It's, um, in a literal sense, I was saying that is sweet to, for me to do that. So he was happy. Amen. 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 You're smiling. Yes. Right. How are you? Um, for me, it was uh, really heart affecting. I prayed for a guy named Drew when we went over to Cass. He said that he missed the vein and that his hand was numb. And so I, I prayed for him, and I want everybody to pray for him. Um, in your I want to ask you to pray. Pray right now. Heavenly Father, we lift up Drew to you, Father God. Give him strength. He said he was weak. Give him strength to go to the doctor, Father God. Lift him up, Father God, to, for your help, Father God. That, and reveal yourself to him, Lord Jesus, in a great and mighty way, that you're the one that helps him. You're the one that he needs. Just heal his body, soul, spirit, and mind, Father God. We break every bondage in the name and authority of Jesus Christ to deliver him, Father God, from the bounds of addiction, Father God. And we love him, Lord. Help him to know that he's loved by people. Send Christians and other people in his pathway to help him, Father God. I left him in God's hands, and he's in your hands, Father God. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, what do you think? I had fun. It was a long walk but we made it. And we prayed. We saw a lot of people. Is this your first time? No, my second time. The What's this doing for you? Huh? What's this do for you when you go? Um, it really makes me humble myself and appreciate everything that we have here and just, uh, to just like, I don't know, I just feel real bad for them, you know, and I just pray for them, everybody that came across, just being able to pray for them and give them something to eat and some water. Does that help you think that maybe we're not so bad? Our lifestyle's not quite so bad we go out there because we're griping about it, you know, how hard it is for us. But then we see them. Does that stir you up a bit? Yeah, it it makes me appreciate everything we have here and just appreciate life in general and just we have it so good here and people do complain about but I mean compared to what they have out there, they have nothing. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Fire it up. Thank you, Jesus. You gotta move down with it. That was you. You stuck your tongue out. Do it again. Um, it was it was good. Um, I crossed paths with one of the gentlemen that I crossed paths with last week, and he's here actually. Um, he yeah. took the foot in the door, David. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you, David? Where are you? Oh, David. Okay. Well, he's here, and All right. he told me that I could sell a lion to a cat, so he's here. <laughs> But thank you, Jesus. He made it. Um, 
And another one that, that um, crossed paths with me today was Kiona, and her mother just passed away a few days ago, and you know, she's been having a hard time, you know, she's suicidal, we just got to keep her deep in prayer, guys, that little girl needs love from yeah, us, this God. is our family right here, and just like, I just, it hurts me, it hurts me, because even when I was out of the program, I was in another, um, what do you call it, halfway house with her, and I just, she has my heart. That's it. I love her. But anyways, I had an amazing time, and it helps me. Is this fun? Oh, it's definitely fun. <laughs> Sergeant. Oh, it was wonderful. We came across a gentleman today named Mac. He, uh, he was homeless, too, as well, but he was... Uh, his needs were put on a back burner. He was actually trying to help somebody else, so he had to prepare for them, Amen. not himself. So that was a real big, that was a real big impact for me right there. So somebody has nothing, still has nothing, but he still had the lonely. He had Jesus Christ there, just go watching over him. But he wanted to have prayer for somebody else other than himself. So. Amen. Amen. That's what, that's what God's doing. Right. So how's the creek? The, the creek. Yeah, how's the creek? Uh, the creek. The creek. Okay. The creek. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's um, wonderful. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about who Warren Jeffs is, but he's a uh, evil man. But basically, we took what his house was, his compound, we're turning it into a light and a beacon in the center of the town right there. In his house, right there. So we're bringing lives in like left and right, and the stories are just, they can make your skin crawl. I mean, even for me, I've been through a lot, but this was just like, wow, you know. So uh, basically, um, I'm going to be going back. So. Um, my phase two is done and completed. I'll be heading back up there as a staff and I'll be working up there with everybody in the community. Colonel. Colonel, I'm going to be sticking by him and all the way until I decide to go. And then basically, uh, I'm going to. Tell us what the Colonel's doing. Who, who the Colonel is? Well, oh, Colonel Dusty Brian Rhodes. Brian Dusty Rhodes. He was a Colonel I served with overseas in 2003. He sent me on a few missions over there under his under his command. Uh, he has came back. He was. It was miraculous that he came in here uh, Friday morning devotions, and he came in and started volunteering his time here. We have a class going on for uh, mentorship with the gentleman here, uh, basically bringing self-discipline and integrity to a man, realizing who they are and what they are and what they can accomplish and who they can be. So, thank you, Sergeant. Sir. Okay. How was it? How was it? Just uh, blessed to be here. How was that? Oh, it's rough out there, you know, every time I go out there, it's just a humbling experience, you know, especially going over there by cash, you know, all the people over there hurting it and in pain, and it's just, it's just rough, but we're blessed, and now we are, you know, just get a word, give God uh, his blessings, and just go out and do God's work. Amen. God bless. Let's get a word of this. We are wrapping up the book of Mark today. So we turn to the last chapter of Mark. The last chapter of Mark, Mark 16. Chapter 16. Now when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint them. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked out, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief 
and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. 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 You know, that's kind of neat. First thing he said after he came out of his testing was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He sent people out. He's sending us out. And he said, if you go, I'm going to go with you. Let me believe that. And I, you know what he wants us to do is just listen to him and simply trust him, believe in him, and watch him. Just like he says, the signs. There'll be signs when we go preach the word. Signs. Cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up a servant, bring in anything, lay hands on and so forth. How many believe that? You know, you know, here's where God is so neat. If, you, if, you, if we can just get past him enough to realize he wants to minister to us, then he wants to use us, and then he wants to build us, then he tests us. And probably the biggest testing is money. Emily, what? That seems to be what people have the most trouble giving to God. You know, it's, it's funny, you can give to God yourself. You know, mostly, but except your money. Then the battle starts. But you know what is so neat about God? He says, you give, and let's show me. Let me show you what I'm going to do if you give. Trust me. In one place he says that. See if I don't do what I say, in other words. How many can say, you know what? Maybe I, 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 if I'm going to serve God, i got to serve him fully, not partially. And that means giving everything. And that's... It's, it's really neat when you start doing that because wait, you're free. You think you got money problems? You think you got every kind of all problems? You start giving away what you need. Whether it's money, friendship, whatever it is you need. And see what happens. But the enemy's telling us, no, don't do that. No, 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 no. But you cannot believe what God will do if we'll just let him have his way. Especially with money. Unbelievable how God is able to... I start tithing the day I got saved, and I've never worried about money ever since. I got a dump card, whatever I need, I give them the card, I hope there's money behind it. <laughs> and I every once in a while go looking at it, but hey, there's money there! <laughs> really? See, I, you gotta catch this. I used to worry about money. I don't worry about it anymore. Not at all. I mean, you gotta be conserved. Don't, don't get me wrong. But you just, your personality, you just, and God working in you, as you learn to give, he's going to bless you and encourage you. And this is what he does with everything. But it seems like our biggest problem happens seems to be given finances. Amen? We have some needs here just recently. You know, with our insurance. Well, somehow or another, it's paid. Amen. We have needs, you know, in Gallup. Somehow or another, that's being taken care of. Amen. Man, we had a thing going in Gallup that's kind of neat. I think we got, we had to buy a bunch of beds and or well, everything else, you know, we've got we to gotta get a little van pretty soon. We've got a little bus up there, it's a long story, but it's just neat. God takes us day by day, minute by minute, meeting all our needs. And man, every place we go, there's needs. But God says, look, you start giving, there's going to be a storehouse. And whatever you need is in that storehouse. If we'll give. And then he's going to bless us back. How many of you just say, okay, God, it's about time for me to... Start giving my finances. You say, well, I got money. People who don't got no money, I'm telling you what. <laughs> Go look at the, con the concession machines around here. <laughs> See people drinking those energy drinks. They ain't that not cheap. Where's all the money come from? <laughs> Somehow or another. And then, you know, when somebody's hurting, it seems like a lot of people rise to the occasion. Here comes the money. You just, can you imagine if you just let God have his way, he's going to give back? Try me and see if I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings you can't even contain. Let's see what happens. That's 
In fact, what we all need to do is all of us jump in this offering bucket. Our salary, our money, and everything else. Amen? Let's just do this. Let's just be really obedient unto God. Heavenly Father, you chose us. You called us. You got the plan. You are doing your plan to us. It's a matter of us just being willing. And so we ask you, God, just to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We get the musicians up here, the ushers up here. And we're going to take our offering. Come on, Praise the Lord. If you don't know An An Angelica here, uh, I just want to brag on her for a minute. She uh, she won the uh, first place at the talent show. Yeah. And we're going to do the song that she uh, that she won first place with, called "Open the Eyes." Open the eyes of my heart.
don't have any graduates today, which is amazing. But we're thinking we get to the pastors, deacons, ushers, Green Beret, to pass off the elements. I'll tell you, we're going to have a great preacher today. We're just been kind of just letting God be God. I'm really looking forward, so... But you know, just let God be God. Just trust in Him minute by minute through every part of our life. And just watch Him put things together. And you know, the community reminds us of what He's done. So, just take the elements. And you, many of us might not be ready at this time, but you see, it's not us, it's God. And how do we get, how do you say, well, how do you get ready? You don't. You just submit to God, yield to Him, and He will do the rest. How many believe that? See, it's so very, very difficult because we give us the flakes. But when, when I was growing up, we were workers. We worked. We had to work for everything. You couldn't accept, you couldn't take anything. You had to work for it. I've always been like that. Well, you see, you can't be a flake and you can't be a worker. You just got to let God have His way. And here's what I'm talking about. Because he's the one that's done it all. And now he just speaks to our heart. He's saying, I've chosen you. I've called you. My spirit is going out. You can't come to me unless I put the desire in your heart. And it's just a matter of us listening. And once we turn our life over to him, submit to him, we are made righteous instantaneously. That's all there is to it. It's just a matter of us being willing to yield. And he, you, in other words, you're giving him the ability to take over. You're giving him the right in your own life. Just to give it all to him, and then he's going he's to do the rest. And that's exciting to me. Because, you know, that means that you don't have to think about anything, what you're supposed to do, what you can't do, on and on and on. It has nothing to do with that. Nothing. In fact, it really has nothing to do with our works. It's a matter of us submitting and letting God. See, this is the whole thing. Letting God be God. And once we start doing that, we start growing that he starts revealing his plan to us and we start to see and understand what he really, what he has really done and he makes himself so much real to us we, we can understand eyes not seen or ear heard the thing he has in store for us. And there's that excitement in us. And that's all we're going to do this morning with taking communion. Is getting, make sure we're right with him and then realizing what he has done for us. <coughs> and it's so neat. The Apostle Paul was doing it wrong. God spoke to him. Knocked him to the ground. I don't know if many of us maybe need that. And then when Paul says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Who are you first? What would you have me to do? And then he told him, just turn to me if you can. And that's, that's the bomb game. So maybe you've never really made an all-out commitment to serve the Lord here this morning. Maybe you're new here, I don't know. Maybe you just come in the program and you feel a little bit confused. The whole bottom line is submitting to God. That's it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Amen. Hear my voice and open the door. I'll come in with him and sup with him and he with me. In other words, he's, he puts that desire. That's what that knock is. Door handles on the inside. You've got to open the door. Right here. That's all there is to it. You open the door and let him come in. That means you're giving him first place. Is there anybody here this morning that's never really turned your life over to Christ? And he's dealing with you. He's knocking to fill your heart. Do you want to say, yes, Lord, I do. Or, many of you, okay, God bless you, sir. Many of you that are you're slipping back a little bit, you know what I'm talking about, but he's dealing with you too. And you're asking him, Lord, forgive me. Other people here, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but is there people here also, then there's just many, many others that are called into ministry. And we're struggling with that. He's knocking hard on that too. He's putting that desire in our heart just to take that other step. And maybe today, maybe this is the time for you to make that decision also. But whatever it is, whatever God's put in your heart, could you just simply say, your will, not my will, and just learn what it means. Or no, let him show you and just submit to him and he'll do the rest. Amen? Pray with me. Say, dear God, dear God, you're dealing with me. Dear God, dear God. I know what you want me to do. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do that. My way's been wrong. And you're showing me what you want me to do. Jesus, I believe you died on that cross for my sins. And you're guiding me. You're becoming real to me. 
just showing me what your plan is. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to give it all to you. You take it. I'm giving it to you. My life is yours. I mean that. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. And that's still be it. Just like I was doing at the altar this morning. Just your will, God, not mine. And then he'll be able to take us from there. Amen. So I don't care if you come in here snockered up. I don't care what happened. If you turned your life to God and ask you to forgive you, you're made righteous at that point. Amen. And so we're more than willing now to take the elements. Now, if you haven't done that, please don't do it because it's dangerous to mess with God. You understand what I'm saying? That's the most dangerous thing there is to start messing with God. He's real. He's alive. And He says, which, and by the way, the judgment falls on those. You're better off just, if you're not ready, that's fine. Just leave the elements underneath the chair or whatever and don't take them. Amen? But for the rest of us, like the Apostle Paul, let's see, I've got the thing upside down. In 1 Corinthians, eleven twenty-three. For I received of the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, and when, when he was betrayed, he took he took this bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it up. Listen, Paul was persecuting the church. Hell bent. When he when he turned his life over to Jesus, he was so transformed that now he's probably one of the greatest advocates for the church. And see, this is what I'm saying. It's not us that does it. It's God's doing it. That's the same way with us. And now he wants us to remember what happened to him, and he wants us to remember what Jesus Christ did for us when he died on that cross for our sins, to redeem us, to set us free. Not only that, but to defeat the enemy of our souls. Sin no longer has control over us when we become Christians. That's that true. Sin no longer has dominion. We're no longer in the law, we're under the grace of God. Amen? Amen. So let's just remember that. For, and he, he's dealing with us, showing us where we've been, where we're at, it's, it's a personal thing between you and God. Amen. Just like with Paul, just like with all of us. Okay. So he, so when he, when he gave him thanks, he broke the bread and he said, Take eat, this is my body. Remember, do this in remembrance of me. Let's do it. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant of my blood. The old covenant, you couldn't, nobody could go into the Holy of Holies for a priest once a year. Now is this new covenant. Not only can we go into the Holy of Holies, but Christ is coming living inside of us. 24 hours a day, we can have a relationship with Him. Amen? Amen? So remember, He said, this cup is a new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it, you remember from me. Just remember what He's done, just by taking that. Heavenly Father, we just truly really thank you, Lord. God, make it so real to us. Now, open our hearts, God, for the message you have for us. Open our hearts. I pray, God, we'd be more than willing to listen. That we become part of this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Mark Buckley has known him for years and years and years. He, oh, my land, I can go way back. We've, we've been playing golf off and on and just... He's done so many, many, many neat things. He's got one of the neatest, biggest churches here in town. And for some reason, or other, he likes down and outers. He likes us. And he comes and teaches for a wean all the time. So I invited him if, if he would consider coming on a Sunday morning. He said, yes, I was shocked. So he's a good one. He loves God. Pastor Mark, come on over here. Thank you, Walt. It is a blessing for me to be here today. Good morning, Church on the Street. I brought my son-in-law, Robert Playstead, with me today. Robert, just stand up and say hi to everybody. He survived being my son-in-law the last 10 years, and, and I'm proud of him. Um, I'm going to share from two passages of Scripture today, Acts 28 and Numbers 21, if you want to open a Bible there. Acts 28. Numbers 21. I'm thankful for Walt and Lewin and for this spiritual family. 
You folks are a family in Christ, and we need one another. Every family in Christ has a certain amount of challenges, dysfunction, pain, as well as blessing and encouragement, and it's life-giving. It's just like every natural family. I, I said that recently at a memorial service where a guy had died of an overdose. I said, your family has had some dysfunction and pain, and the, the dad of the guy who died wanted to punch me out afterwards for saying such a thing. But it's true. I'm, I'm called to speak the truth, to love people by being honest, walking in the light. In this story that we're going to look, out, uh, look at this morning, it, the title of this message is Shake Off the Snake. It's a story of a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul who was on his way to prison. Now if you were on your way to prison, you'd probably be hoping and praying that the van you were riding in would break down, get in a crash, the back doors would fling open, and you'd be on your way to freedom, right? Well, Paul was doing something a little bit different. He's on his way to prison. He knows it may be a death sentence. He's on a ship, and uh, he had warned the captain of the ship, do not sail this winter because there's going to be a storm and it's going to be trouble. The captain thought Paul had mixed motives, and he didn't listen to him. And so there, there is a storm that comes up, and it starts... Uh, tossing and turning the ship. The ship is going through the Adriatic Sea. It finally, after 14 days and night of darkness, um, they had to literally throw everything overboard. The ship crashes on a sandbar, and it begins to break up. The, the soldiers on board wanted to kill the prisoners who were being taken to Rome um, because they knew that if the prisoners escaped, the soldiers would be held accountable for their lives. But the, the head centurion wanted to save Paul's life, so he says, no, we're not, we're not killing the prisoners. Everybody swim ashore. So they took planks off the ship. They didn't have life preservers in those days. They took boats. They did whatever they could. They drifted into shore on this island called Malta, and that's where we pick up the story. It says, once safely, Acts 28, 1, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. They were soaking wet from being in the ocean, and now, now it's raining, now it's cold. They're freezing, they're shivering. The islanders build a big bonfire. Verse 3, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper which is a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. In other words, it, it bit him, and it's hanging down off of his hand. The fangs were deep into Paul's hand. Paul goes over to the, 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 the fire, and it says, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that you would help me speak your word clearly and boldly, that your Holy Spirit would continue to move. Lord, I thank you for the purity here today. I thank you for the passion here today. I thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be here with my brothers and sisters let your spirit make your word come alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there are certain things that happen when you get bit by a snake, okay? For the, the first thing is, it hurts, and it hurts really, really bad. Second thing is, it can happen at a completely unexpected time. Completely unexpected. <coughs> The third thing is, the people who see it happen to you can judge you. They can assume that the reason you just got bit by a snake was you're a bad guy. You might have survived what you went through in the ocean. You survived the shipwreck. But your destiny has come upon you. And your destiny is to be death because of your sin. 
How many of you have felt completely judged when something goes wrong? Something unexpected. Something that's already hurting. Something that, and you begin to wonder yourself. I wonder if God has brought me to this point because he wants to punish me. I, w I wonder if he's brought me to this point because he's trying to show everybody that he doesn't really care about me. I was putting some firewood into our fireplace a winter night a couple of years ago and and uh, as I'm throwing the wood in from the wheelbarrow, carrying it into the living room, throwing it right into the fireplace, all of a sudden, wow, I, I got this incredible sting. It felt like a wasp sting. But instead of being a typical wasp sting that that went away right away, it kept getting worse and worse, and I knew immediately what it was. It was a scorpion that was in our wood pile. Now, my wife had been bit by a scorpion before, and my daughter, Kelly, Robert's wife, had been bit by a scorpion a couple of times in our house. But there's a scripture in Luke 10, 17 that says, I will give you power over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will hurt you. So it hurt my wife, it hurt my daughter, but I'm assuming that God has given me his word and his word is protecting me. And that's what I assumed for the first 12 years we lived in that house until two years ago at that wood pile and I'm throwing the wood in and yeah, maybe I'm just as human as the rest of them. Maybe I'm just as vulnerable as the rest of them. Maybe the Word of God that's protected me in the past for some reason isn't protecting me. But maybe this isn't the end of the story. Maybe there's more to the story. So Paul goes over to the bonfire. And this is what it says. Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and said, he's a god. Now that, that's a pretty big shift in, in opinion. He went from being, you're, you're a a man who's getting what he deserved. You're a guy that escaped and escaped and escaped, but justice has caught up with you to, wow, poisonous snake. It should have it had its venom into your heart by now. You should be convulsing on the floor by now. In 2010, I was on a vacation with our family up at the Russian River in Northern California, and every morning I'd get up because most of the folks on vacation with us, our grandkids and all, they were sleeping in in the mornings. And I would get up, I'd walk down the path to the river and go over the bridge to the other side of the river and there was a place to, uh, to pray over there. And I used to enjoy doing that. I'd bring a little chair from the beach and I'd put down a little blanket and I'd have read the word a little bit, pray a little bit. Sometimes I'd lay on the towel, sometimes I'd just sit on the chair, and that was my morning devotional. One, one afternoon, I'm getting ready to go swimming in the river, and my wife says to me, what's on your back? And I look and said, no, oh, nothing. And she says, yeah, you got a hole on your back there. You were bit by a spider. And I go, oh, it's no big deal. She says, you ought to go to the doctor and get that looked at. And I'm like, I'm on vacation, you know. It's going to be fine. It doesn't seem, it, it, I didn't even notice it until you told me. She says, well, that's a big hole. And she started to get upset, and I just basically blew her off. Well, about... Uh, Two weeks later, I got a bad fever, and uh, it, it really bothered me, and I'm, I'm coughing and sweating and, and all the rest, and, and it went away eventually, and, and then about a month after that, I got another fever, and this one was even worse, and it, it was making me, would give me a high temperature, and I'm sweating night sweats, and I was taking Benadryl to help me sleep and break the fever, and finally I decided to go to the doctor. And I go to the doctor, and the guy is, does the stethoscope on my heart, and he says, well, how, how long have you had this heart murmur? I said, I don't have a heart murmur. I've gone to the doctor many times since I was a kid. I've never had a heart murmur. And he goes, well, yeah, you do. And um, what had happened, unbeknownst to me, to make a long story short, was 
a spider bit me on the back. And when the spider bit me on the back, it created a hole in my back. And when I'm swimming in the, the Russian River there, the water isn't as pure as it maybe ought to be and it should be. And the bacteria got in through the spider bite and got into my bloodstream and it created the fevers. And I had three fevers in a row. And uh, those fevers were actually a sign that my body was being poisoned. And uh, within another month, I was in the hospital having open heart surgery because my mitral valve had been completely destroyed by the bacteria in my bloodstream. And, and right before I had the open heart surgery, a couple comes in. Now, we have a lot of people in our church, and they were praying for me, and I appreciated that very much. But this is a couple that was new to our church, and they basically said that uh, we want to pray for you, and as soon as we pray for you, you're going to be healed, and as soon as you're healed, you can leave. You don't have to have the surgery. And I said, well, I appreciate you being here to pray for me. And, um, and they prayed for me, and, and nothing much seemed to happen. And um, they were so offended that I went ahead and had the open heart surgery that they left our church. I want to I wanna give you some suggestions. What should you do after a snake bites you? Number one, shake off the snake. Paul wasn't just saying, oh, I feel bad for this snake, this poor little thing. No, he shook it off into the fire, let it die. Last night, I, I'm heading to bed, and my wife says, what's that? And it was a scorpion on the floor. She says, kill it. I'm not like, oh no, it's a little scorpion. We need to help it find its habitat in the backyard where it belongs. No, I went and got my shoe and stomped on that thing in a hurry. Shake off the snake. Your destiny is not to be poisoned. Your destiny is not to be... Uh, anyway, number two. Get treatment if necessary. Some, some snake bites, and I'm using this metaphorically now, some snake bites are poison in your soul. And sometimes you need to process the poison out of your soul by going to some counseling, sharing the story, letting somebody know what's happened to you. Talk with them, pray with them. And, and, and get whatever kind of treatment is necessary. Number three, share your stories with others. Tell people what's happened to you because your story is redemptive. You have a unique story. We overcome him, it says in Revelation 12. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, because we love not our life even unto death. Our testimony is sharing our story. I wish I didn't have to have a story about having an open heart surgery. It hurt really, really bad. But that's part of my story. Now, when they, when they went to repay, replace my mitral valve, uh, I'm gonna, the fourth point is resist false judgments. When they went to replace my mitral valve, they discovered that my aortic artery was almost completely blocked. What that meant was that in spite of the fact that I work out all the time and I hike and all the rest, that at any time I could have dropped dead from a heart attack because of all the junk I ate as a kid and my genetic vulnerability. And in my mind, when I'm laying there about to have the open heart surgery, I'm thinking, God, I don't know why you let this happen to me. I, I'm trying to be a faithful servant. My son Philip said to me, he said this, he said, I think that God saw you out there praying every day and he knew that you had a genetic vulnerability and an aortic, uh, uh, aortic uh, artery that was about to kill you. And so he sent a little spider to bite you on the back so that when they went to replace your valve, they actually took care of the thing that was most important. Resist false judgments. You don't know why you're here. You do not know why you're here. Some of you might have been sentenced to here by a judge. Some of you might have come, been dragged into this spiritual family against everything you ever wanted. But you are here for a purpose. It's not just to get sober. It's not just to, to get yourself positioned so you can get a better place and a better deal someday. This is about 
you being formed and fashioned into the purposes of God, not just for yourself, but for your whole extended family and the network of people that you're going to shine as a light to. The fifth thing that I would re recommend is that you resist simplistic formulas. When I, before I had the open heart surgery, I had somebody write me a letter, somebody who loved me very much, and he said, if you would just take these vitamins, you're going to be fine. We had, a, we had a, a group in our church that was a cancer support group that met there for years. And every now and then, somebody would come up with a simplistic formula, whether it was a potion people should drink, or whether it was a prayer people should pray, and if they would do this simple prayer and just believe in the simple way, everything was going to be fine. One of the leaders of that group came to me for counseling after her son died from cancer. And she said, I feel horrible. And I said, I, I know what it's like to lose a son. She goes, no, you don't know what I went through because I believed that you should just believe the prayer formula and you should never admit the possibility that he could die. So my son died and I never even said goodbye to him before he died. That to me is cruel. It's cruel. If our salvation or our answer to prayer is dependent on our perfect attitude or our perfect words, we're all up a creek. You hear me? Because we don't have the capacity to always think right, always feel right, always speak right. We don't have that capacity. Healing is a gift from God. It's called a gift because we don't deserve it. Now, it will help us if we think about that which is pure and right and lovely. It will help us if we know the Word of God and speak the Word of God and believe the Word of God. It will help a lot to receive the gifts that He has for us, but they're still gifts. Grace is a gift. Grace is the power to live the life that He wants us to live. So that we're not going through life feeling guilty about how far short we always fall. Well, as a kid, I was always trying to do good, and I always fell short, and I always felt guilty, so I quit going to church for years because I didn't want to feel guilty. It took me a while to discover that it's all about grace. It's all about His power, what He did on the cross, and us trusting Him, and as we trust Him, good stuff happens. Lots of good stuff. Number six, I'm going to give you seven. Don't pretend it never happened. You get bit by a snake, something goes bad in your life. Don't pretend it never happened. Don't just try and stuff it. And number seven, prepare your heart for a special blessing. Amen. Let's go on with this story, verse seven. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So, what ultimately happened as a result of Paul's snake bite? First, Paul and his companions were honored by the natives, because... The fact that, that he did not die as a result of the snake bite made them think this guy's got something special. So when the, the chief's dad was laying sick and almost dying, they said, would you come and pray for him? Paul, number two, Paul was able to pray for healing for the chief's father and many others. Number three, the islanders heard all the good news the good news about Jesus. Number four, they were furnished with supplies for the rest of their voyage. And number five, preachers have a great topic for sermons. <laughs> Lots of good things came out of this. Lots of good things. Some of you know that um, a number of years ago, back in 1992, our oldest son drowned, and we were heartbroken. We were grieved. There was a, a girl that used to hang out with my son. She's six foot four. That's pretty tall for a white girl. And uh, she's a really smart girl, um, but she was a complete non believer. The day before he drowned, this girl came to church for the very first time with one of her other friends. 
and uh, she heard the gospel, was part of the worship. It meant almost nothing to her, I know, because after the service, they came over to our house, they had lunch, and uh, I said, what did you think of church? And she's like, you know, it just didn't phase her. Well, the next day, they're all out on the Salt River, and they're tubing and playing, no dr drugs or alcohol, but they're just celebrating having school out, and my son drowns, and he's in a coma for three days before he dies. The girl's in the hospital, seeing the, the, the grief, seeing the pain, knowing how much we loved our son, and her eyes are opened at that point to Jesus, and she accepts Christ. She, she comes and she hangs around our house, not just for a day or two, but for the next few years. She goes to college during that time. She'd come back and hang around our house. And I knew that she had a dream for her life, that she hoped to get married someday. But a six foot four white girl that's pretty intellectual, there isn't a lot of uh, guys that fit the bill. There was another guy that used to hang around our house by the name of Jamie, and he liked my daughter. But my daughter didn't like him as a boyfriend. And so uh, one day, next thing we know, Jamie is liking this girl, Alicia, and time goes on, and they get married, and they get married, and, and they're broke, but they have a little baby girl, and, and they're all happy about that, and he's struggling to finish his school, and then they, she gets pregnant again, and when she gets pregnant again, the, we get terrible news. The terrible news is that Alicia, this girl that we loved who came to Christ when our son died, now has cancer, and the doctors are saying to her, you better get an abortion right now because we have to remove your ovaries because it's uterine cancer and you're gonna you're gonna die because the hormones stimulating the growth of the baby are also stimulating the tumor in your womb. And uh, she and her husband start praying, and uh, they had they had really been looking forward to this child, even though they were a struggling young couple and two kids was going to be a lot. And uh, now they had an excuse for an abortion, but they also believed that they served a God who could somehow work all things together for the good. And she basically went back to the doctors against the pressure of her parents and her family that was saying, get the abortion, we don't want you to die. And she said, if I die, I die, but we believe God wants us to have this child. So she went ahead and had the child, and this second little baby girl is born healthy. And, and then she had a partial hysterectomy where they removed the tumor, the cancerous tumor, and one of her ovaries. And she was told, don't ever have another child because the cancer could come back. But she loves God and she loved her husband and she went ahead and got pregnant again. Well, the fa her family freaks out and, and it's one of those deals where what are you going to do? And uh, they have a third child and then they have a fourth child, then they have a fifth child, then they have a sixth child. Today they've got six kids, and they're raising their kids to love and serve Jesus, because she had to face down cancer and the threat that her life could end, and she had a sense in her heart that she had a destiny, and her destiny is to be a mom and to raise up kids who love Jesus. Now that, that's not a, a world-changing thing, and that's not saying that anybody who whoever had a, an operation and made it so they couldn't have children is doing the wrong thing. But in her situation, when she was snake bit by cancer, it was not going to define her destiny any more than being born six foot, you know, and grown to be six foot four and then having very few guys around that are interested in dating you. You know what I mean? Everybody has some things in life that seem to make it so that their destiny is going to be determined by pain. It's going to be determined by a snake bite. It's going to be determined by something that you can't control. But in reality, our God who created us, who loves us, who's chosen us, and will use each and every one of us, is bigger than the pain of life. He came as a healer to transform us. Let me give you one more quicker story in uh, Numbers chapter 21. It says this. This is the people of Israel traveling through the desert on their way to the promised land after they have left Egypt. Numbers 21, verse 4. The title of this little section is, What About a Snake Bite That Comes From Our Sin? They traveled from... Mount Hor, along the route to the Red Sea, to go around Edom. 
but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. We detest this miserable food. I don't like my roommate. I wish I had a television set. I don't have my cell phone. They are disturbed. They are grumbling. They are frustrated. They are tired of their situation. They're wondering why God has left them in this situation so darn long. Then the Lord listens and sends venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. You think things are bad now? Things can get a heck of a lot worse. I, I looked at one of my friend's hands one time, and he had a big, big scar on his hand. I said, Bob, what happened? And he said, I got bit by a rattlesnake, and my whole hand swelled up, and they had to cut it and drain it. And it was, you know how he got bit by a rattlesnake? Because he's a, a collector of weird things. And he found a baby rattlesnake and he brought it to his house and put it in his cage, even though it's not legal to bring him home. And he got it out one day and he was playing around with it because he was claiming the scripture that we read this morning from Mark 16, that they can handle snakes and they'll be all right. And he got bit and he learned something. That sometimes your sin can get you in trouble. Your presumption... Your, your naivete that because I'm a believer, I'm not subject to the regular laws of the universe. What Jesus is saying here is if you're following me, if you're obeying me, you don't have to worry about the snakes and the scorpions. You don't have to worry about the demonic forces in the world. But if you're fooling around, if you're playing games, if you're being presumptuous, if you think you've got some kind of divine super shield around you, you may have some lessons to still learn. Verse 7 says, The people came to Moses and said, We've sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The people were bit because they were grumbling and complaining, because they weren't appreciating the grace of God, because they got impatient, and, and the whole thing started to degenerate. There was a girl by the name of Chris who grew up in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. She was born to two alcoholics. And um, her parents were getting loaded a lot. They weren't paying much attention to her. She got scarlet fever when she was a young girl and spent almost a year in bed. Her heart rec received major damage because of the neglect of her parents and because of the fever she got and how they didn't respond adequately right away. She missed school. She was behind. She was rejected by a lot of the kids in her school. Uh, her mom went into a mental institution when she was nine years old. Her dad brought in a housekeeper who had a son. The housekeeper sexually abused her. When you're nine years old, you love your dad your mom's gone, and you get abused, you're, you're getting into a deep, deep pit. As she got older, her mom got out of the hospital, and she and her little brother are with her parents one night, and her parents go into a bar, and the kids are supposed to stay quiet in the corner, the parents get into a great big fight, next thing you know, the cops are called, the parents are held, hauled off to jail, and her and her little brother go to a juvenile detention center, because there was nowhere else to put her. Her life was snake bit in a lot of ways. There were things that had happened to her that hurt really, really bad. When uh, 
she got a little older, she had one hope, one dream, and that was that someday she could maybe be a nurse or even a doctor, because she knew that the doctors had saved her life when she had had the scarlet fever, even though she had heart problems. Long story short, when she was 17 years old, her parents took off and moved to Puerto Rico. She had accepted Christ, and so she moves in with her pastor into a little discipleship house. She's living in this discipleship house, and she, she applies after high school to go into a nursing program, That her dream. And the nursing program at the college said to her, there's no way we can let you in because your situation is unstable, because you don't really have much money, because you don't have a family backing you. Sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. So her dream had to die. She gets married to, and when she gets married, she's living in a discipleship house with a guy, and she keeps talking about this dream. She'd really like to be a nurse, and the guy's like, sorry, it's, it's not too practical. She has her kids, her first son is born, her first son has got terrible asthma and eczema. She's up every night with him for hours on end. She finally has to move from California to Arizona to try and save his life. She goes on. And, and she's trying to be a faithful life, wife and, and follow Jesus. Some people move in next door to her. They've got six kids. The day after they moved in next door, the husband gets sent to prison. So for the next three and a half years, she helps raise not only her four kids, but those six kids. Fast forward 25 years later. 25 years later, the lady who was the mother of the six kids is dying. She goes to visit the mother to say goodbye before she dies. The five of the six kids gather around her. The oldest had drowned. He was dead. The second oldest was standing there along with his four sisters. And the, the, the girls start to say to Chris, they said, if it wasn't for you, we would have been homeless. If it wasn't for you, we would have been on the streets. You helped our mom raise us. You helped her to get us to doctor's appointments, to get us to school. You did all of this for us. And now, because they had gathered from around the country, we just want to say thank you for everything. And, and Chris started to cry. And, and I, I was there, and I was just really touched. And I know this story is completely true, because that Chris, I call her Christina, has been my wife for 45 years. <laughs> 45 years. And the boy that was there, his name is Mark Murrow, and he is an MD. And the four girls that were standing there are all nurses. All are men. Even though we could not afford her ever leaving and becoming the nurse that she wanted to be, she raises these kids, and they're all having an incredible, fruitful ministry. Why is that? Why is it? Because every time she got snake bit, she continued to believe, that is not going to define me, that is not going to destroy me, because I serve a God who is bigger than that. And when she married a guy, me, who wasn't willing to give her the time and the energy to and the financial support to go live out her dream, she still believed that she had a God that was big enough to make her life count. So she served any way she could, and now today she's honored as somebody who has raised out and sent out people to fulfill something that is beyond her capacity if she had spent her whole life in the medical field. And, and that's the story of all of us. All of us have been snake bit. All of us have a choice. Are we going to shake it off, or is that going to define us? Are we going to be feeling sorry for ourselves, or are we going to make the most of our life? We don't all have the resources to do to pursue our dreams the way we want to pursue them, but we all have a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we ask or imagine through Christ who lives in us. Amen.
Let's close with prayer. You can give us a little background, Pat, if you don't mind. Father God, I've been snake bit at times because I've grumbled, I've complained, I've, I've manipulated, I've cheated, and I've destroyed. But I, you, have, you have someone lifted up on a pole by the name of Jesus that has died so that I could be forgiven for my sins. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here today. You have provided a way for all of us to enter your kingdom, to believe you, to trust you, to receive your grace. If you're here this morning and, and you're sensing God's calling you that there's more grace for you, it's because it's true. It, you can believe Him. You can believe Him. If you want somebody to pray with you this morning before you leave this room, then come on up to the altar. We'll lay hands on you. We'll pray for you to be filled with the Spirit, to receive the grace of God. Go ahead, and we don't want you to miss this opportunity. If you've been struggling because somebody hurt you, somebody disappointed you, somebody betrayed you, this is a good time to say, Lord, help me. I'm going to let them go. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to put myself in your hands. I want my life to count Jesus. Let your kingdom come, Jesus. Let your will be done, Jesus. I believe that's every one of us just want this altar. I think what he's saying is God can make a, a good thing out of what we think a bad thing. And that's why when we turn our life over to Him, we just got to let Him be God. Let Him lead. Let Him have His way. Because it's not over yet. It's not been set or done. So, how many can just say in your heart, okay, Lord, I'm, on, I'm ready to let you have your way. Come on up here this altar. Just let the Holy Spirit deal with you. I'll tell you what, I'd rather love to lose than ever love at all. I'd rather get in this game, sell out, and let it happen. Let God have his way. And be reluctant and hold back. I'm going to ask Mark if he'd come up here and pray. I know there's just too many of them for him to lay hands on everybody. Lord, thank you for your refreshing and your blessing. Lord, you know the depth of our need. You know the the passion and desires you put within us. I ask, Lord, that you would grant the desires of the hearts of those who are now calling on your name, that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that we would be able to drink from the living water that comes from your heaven through your spirit, each and every one of us. The Lord has called you and he has anointed you and he will equip you to fulfill the destiny for which you have been created. Fear not, I am with you, says the Lord. Bless you. We're going to continue to pray for a few minutes. So if you want to stay and pray, feel free. If you want to go in peace, go in peace. God bless you. You want to stay there? Go ahead. Go ahead. Been back tonight. Have a good one.